Well, hey, everyone, thanks for joining us today. We are in week three of a series called Living Life Backward. And every week of this series, we like to remind people of this happy thought. You're going to die someday. (laughs) Not just you, but everyone. Aren't you glad you came to church? (laughs) And Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, see, he has this big idea that a proper perspective on death is the key to a better life. Starting with the end and living backward changes our perspective and in theory should improve the way we live forward. Several months ago, I introduced you to our brand new golden retriever puppy, Scout, Scouty, Scouterson, Alexander. It's a whole story, but his name's Scout. But unfortunately, we found out about a month ago that Scout has something called congenital renal failure. That means he was born with smaller kidneys, that will fail much sooner than they should. And the vet predicts that his life will last um, anywhere from one to five years. Of course, anything can happen, and we honestly do pray for Scout, but that does mean he's, he's terminal. It's been a really difficult and sad pill for us to swallow because of how much joy he's brought to our lives. However, this news has changed the way that we Well, at least my wife Emily lets him live. (laughs) For example, like most dogs, he actively pursues human food, but is now big enough to get up on the counter, put his paws up on the counter, and sniff around. The other day, he got a whole piece of Texas toast just right off the counter. And I wasn't happy, so I disciplined him. I took the toast out of his mouth. I beeped his collar and gave him a timeout. But after giving us those golden retriever eyes, okay, and if you know, you know, Emily said, just let him eat the Texas toast. He's going to die soon anyways. (laughs) It's hard to argue with that. But since then, since then, he swiped an entire Big Mac and whole plates of bacon (laughs) right off the counter as she has turned a blind eye because according to her... Why not let him enjoy God's greatest gifts of food, Big Macs and bacon, while he still can? Of course, this news has also caused us to reconsider getting him neutered. I mean, you should hear us talk about it. We're like, why not let him keep everything that he's been given if it's just a (laughs) short time? It's like... But because we just aren't sure how long he'll actually be with us, we, we also soak up every cuddle every run at the dog park, and every early morning bear hug in ways we wouldn't have otherwise. Facing the reality of his death has changed the way that we let him live. And the truth is, it's coming to an end for all of us. While that sounds depressing, Solomon believes this is key to living a meaningful and satisfying life. A couple weeks ago, Jason looked at the first couple chapters of Ecclesiastes and how the pursuit of more, more stuff, more uh, achievement, more pleasure is meaningless, like chasing the wind, a phrase that Solomon uses often. Last week, Ryan looked at Ecclesiastes 3 and the importance of inviting God into whatever season we find ourselves in. That was a very impactful message for me personally. I would encourage you to go watch it. And today... I want to look at Ecclesiastes 4 as we continue on in Ecclesiastes and look at how work fits into a meaningful life because what's the point of work if we're all just going to die someday? No one likes to work, it seems. If you ask people how their job is going, people might respond with a grunt about how they're looking forward to the weekend or, or maybe people work not because they enjoy it but because, well, they have to. We, we need a source of income or maybe people do work to accumulate more stuff or even impress their neighbors, which Solomon tends to think is not really worth it. He says in verse four, I saw that all the toil and achievement spring from one person's envy of another. In other words, he's saying some of us tend to work because we want to be more successful. We want to outwork our neighbors. And then he says this too Achieving in work is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So what's the point of work? Many of us resonate with Genesis chapter 3, where God says to Adam and Eve, because of their disobedience and sin, he says the ground is cursed. It's cursed because of you, because of your sin. 
and disobedience. And then he says, all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Every one of us on some level can understand the struggle of work. But next time you're frustrated, don't blame your boss. Blame Adam and Eve. It's all their fault, all right? <laughs> But more often than not, work is a minefield of stress and challenge and relational conflict. Don't tell my employer. But there are plenty of days that I feel an unhealthy amount of stress, where I dread the relational conflict that I have to lean into, and even, even as a pastor, feel a sense of meaninglessness. What am I doing? How do I deal with that? Does what I do matter? Some of us struggle in our jobs more than others, professional golfer Sergio Garcia has been front and center with this whole PGA Tour versus Live Golf Tour controversy that's dominated the golf headlines in recent months. And in case you don't know, the Live Golf Tour is trying to persuade PGA Tour players to come play the, their tour for more guaranteed money, less actual work, and more time to party, truly. And Sergio, uh, while on the PGA Tour, has been caught on microphone saying several times, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to be done with this. But by the way, since 1999, Sergio has made $43 million on the PGA Tour. And I just got to thinking, how did Sergio go from this young, excited kid known for his iconic run and jump to now someone who is bitter over his current job. Well, I don't know what's going on in his life personally. We're sitting here thinking, come on, man, you play golf for a job. How hard could it be? <laughs> but I just wonder, where, where are you at with your own job right now? Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you're the primary breadwinner, and you can't even begin to think about making a change, even though your boss might be mean and you're Coworkers might be difficult. Or maybe you're someone who's risen to the top of your industry. You've arrived. And yet when you got to this point, you thought you'd feel so much more satisfied. Maybe you're someone who's checked out in your job and you find yourself browsing for new jobs or checking Facebook or your fantasy football team for hours on end. Or maybe you're someone near the end of your career. You're biding your time until you can retire. The job is secure the pay is nice, and the last thing you want to dis do is disrupt this retirement dream. Or maybe you're someone who's chosen to be a stay-at-home parent, and no one really gives you the credit that this is the career that you've chosen. I don't know where you're at, but here's what I do know. There is a better way to work. The question is, how do we pursue a life of meaningful work? Well, first... It's to work. This might seem like a dub, but it's not as obvious as one might think. The COVID-19 pandemic kicked off a tidal wave of people who quit their jobs. By the end of 2021, it had been estimated that approximately 45 million people did just that. So many people quit their jobs in our country that the last year became known as the Great Resignation of course, soon after, it became known as the great regret because people soon realized that you have to have a job in order to receive an income. But this pandemic, this pandemic caused many of us to ask a fair question. Why should I work? Now, while Solomon agrees that the pursuit of work can feel meaningless at times, the answer, according to Solomon, is not to do nothing. Look at verse five, what he says here. Fools... Fools fold their hands, and then they ruin themselves. See, the solution to a meaningful life is not to do nothing and be lazy. It's to work. See, while we often think that work is the result of Adam's sin and a curse from God, that's not God's original intention for work. In Genesis 1, after creating the heavens and the earth and everything in it, at the end of the sixth day, he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. It's not just about having kids, okay? Fill the earth and govern it, work it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky. Many of you have been dominating birds in the sky recently. 
rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. A chapter later, he puts them in the Garden of Eden and tells them to work and keep it. According to the Bible, work wasn't intended to be a curse. It was intended to be a gift from God. We need work. We need meaningful work to feel fully alive and human. Solomon understood the value of work, which is why he writes at the end of chapter three, I saw that there is nothing better for a person to enjoy their work because that is their lot. So how do we live a life of meaningful work? It's to work and then enjoy it while you can. You know, but one of the reasons that we struggle to enjoy our work at times is because people talk about trying to find work-life balance. And can I just say, I feel like that's an unattainable goal. Usually what people mean when they say work-life balance is they want less work and more life or, or time at, you know, personal time. And don't we all? I mean, every one of us has fantasized about working less while still receiving an income. That would be really nice. But the problem I found with pursuing work-life balance is that there's no 50-50 scale that we can measure work on one side and life or family on the other. So I find that this scale causes undue guilt and pressure on people when they can't find this perfect balance and we end up not enjoying work or our time in life with family. There are times in life we have no choice but to carry one side more than the other. Going to school full time and working to put yourself through it, there's not a lot of balance there. There's no balance when a person has to work two jobs to provide for their family. Quitting a job, to stay home with a couple of kids, four kids, five kids, that's not going to bring a lot of balance either. That's why when it comes to work and life, I'm no longer striving for balance. Instead, I'm striving for a fully integrated life. What does that mean? It means that whatever environment I'm in, I'm bringing my very best, and I want to be the same person in wherever I find myself. When I'm at work, I'm doing my best to give it my all. When I'm at home, I'm doing my best to giving it my all. There's no difference in who I am or the energy I bring in either space. And so when my work needs extra from me, I find ways to do so. Knowing it's going to require a sacrifice and tip those scales when my family needs me. Or I can choose to be at a kid's activity over work. I am not going to miss those moments. Of course, when given a chance, I'm going to cheat work for family. I love what I get to do. I love my career. I love my job, but I've only got one family. Balance implies 50-50. A fully integrated life means bringing our best in whatever environment we need to be in. And I want, I want each moment to be lived as a gift from God. And so if we're going to live a life of meaningful work, don't strive for balance. It's just going to heap guilt and shame on you. Instead, strive for a fully integrated life that includes work, and work is a gift from God. With that being said, the second way to pursue a life of meaningful work is don't let work become all-consuming. Because in a world connected like never before, with 24-7 access to emails and texts, it's easy. It's easy for work to become all-consuming. When work no longer needs to be done in a cubicle, a warehouse, or an office, the lines between work and personal time have gotten really blurry. Do you resonate with that at all? According to Solomon, though, just like the solution isn't to do nothing, the alternative is not to do work, pursue work at the detriment of personal health and peace. I want you to see what Solomon says here. One of my favorite scripture verses in the Bible, verse six. Better one handful, one handful with tranquility and peace than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. In other words, what I think Solomon is getting at is that ultimately less work 
and more peace is a better way to live than more work and less peace. And I'm still working towards that, but one of the predominant messages that we hear while growing up, and every one of us heard this message in one way or the other, is to achieve. Come on, John, win games. Get better grades. Move up in your career. And all those things, hear me say, aren't bad to pursue. However, we rarely talk about the potential danger and cost of achievement. I mean, how many stories do we hear of people that have reached the highest levels of success and still will say, well, I'm not really living a meaningful life? How many people become CEO or the leader or the boss but have moved on to their third or fourth marriage? How many people could buy their kids nice cars, name brand clothes, send them to prestigious colleges but but have no relationship with them? How many people make it to the corner office but have done so with no integrity, let alone any kind of purpose and meaning? Is it worth it? Jesus asked a similar question. He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, to achieve everything they set out to achieve, to gain everything that they dreamed of? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet yet lose their soul. Take an honest assessment right now in your spirit. Have you been sacrificing your soul for work in one way or the other? Now, are there times in life that we have to grind at work in order to achieve a mission or succeed in new ways or launch a business? Yes, that's why it's called work. Work is hard. Sometimes 50 to 60 hour weeks are necessary. My grandpa Ralph was born in 1910, and he put himself through college at Oregon State during the Great Depression. Right around the time he finished college, he started his own grocery store in Portland, Oregon, that he ran for 50 years uh, while working six days a week, 10, 12-hour days. He would have laughed hysterically at today's workforce demanding work-life balance while working 20 hours a week at a local coffee shop. Now, I know that we can sometimes exaggerate generational stereotypes, but the generational pendulum when it comes to work seems to have swung really hard. Now, stereotypically, okay, this might not be you, but stereotypically, older generations, Gen X, boomer generation, they may have worked too much and too hard assuming that their company was going to be loyal to them, and so they would sacrifice bits of their personal health and family. They would work really hard and maybe too much. And so younger generations, having seen that, having witnessed what older generations have done, seem to want to work less than that and still receive the same type of lifestyle afforded those who worked diligently for decades. So what's right as these generational ideas on work clash with one another? Well, notice what Solomon says again. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil. One handful. We need work. We need difficult work at times. We need something to pursue and achieve. We were created. People made in the image of God, we were created to work and pursue, but if it's two handfuls where we're not sleeping, we're constantly stressed, we're, we're always checking email, even at the dinner table, we're working late hours, we're, we're putting ourselves in compromising situations, all at the expense of, of our personal health and family, we might be in danger of, of forfeiting our soul in exchange for work. So how do we not let work become all-consuming? Here's an idea. Decide what's essential, then cut back on everything else. In one of my favorite books, a book I've read several times, a book called Essentialism, written by author Greg McCune, he writes this, when you don't purposefully and deliberately choose where to focus your energy and time, other people will choose for you. Before long, you'll have lost sight of everything that is meaningful, and important to you. If we don't decide what matters most, someone else will. 
over the years, I've written down what's most important to me or my values in a variety of ways. But in the last couple of years, I was able to boil it down to the four most important values that apply to all areas of my life, things I'm still working on, trust me. But I read these because I wanna pursue them. I wanna pursue growth as a dad, as a husband, as a little league coach, as a pastor. I wanna pursue growth because movement equals life. Otherwise, I just get stuck and stale and boring. I want to lead big. I want to pursue opportunities for my kids and for my wife and for those closest to me. I want to pursue possibilities at work because those are the things that become reality. I want to choose play. Frankly, I can get really boring and take life way too serious. And so when given the chance, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm choosing play with my family. I'm choosing play with my friends and Choosing golf whenever possible because that leads to freedom. <laughs> but I also want to be present. And this is one I really struggle with. But at the end of the day, I want to be present in whatever environment I find myself in. That's the fully integrated life. I want to be present with my family when I'm there. I don't want to be checking work emails at all hours of the day, but when I'm at work, I want to be present at work because God has called me to this, and I want to give it my best. And so I read those things every single day. I've tucked them in my Bible. I start out my time with God by reading those just to remind myself of the kind of life that I want to pursue, and I'm not good at it all the time, but I'm trying. And so I want to lovingly challenge you to take some time this week and write out or just decide in your heart and your mind what matters most. Why? So work doesn't become all-consuming. It's just one part of life. Third way to a meaningful work is to love people. Love people more than work. Look what Solomon continues on with. He says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. Anyone not content with where God has brought them? And this man asked, for whom am I toiling? And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable biz business. Sad is the person who works endlessly and then has no one to share with. Now this next verse is one you'll often hear at weddings, but Solomon meant these words for work. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. In other words, work is so much more meaningful when we're focused, well, less on me and more on we. How much better would work be if we chose to work for one another? Steve Jobs and Jack Welch are two ex-CEOs, two leaders who are remembered for high levels of achievement despite notoriously not treating people super well. But they're the exception. Most everyone else, when it's all said and done, will be celebrated for how they loved people, not how well they cooked our food or made us money or developed our widgets. For me, I think of Mr. Lemire, my, my third grade teacher, or the playground worker we affectionately called grandma for how they loved me when I was at Columbia Valley Gardens Elementary School in Longview, Washington. I think of Dave and Linda Andrew or Pat and Karen Branscombe or Bill Baker who were my youth you know, church leaders growing up. I don't remember what they accomplished. I don't really remember what their actual jobs were or even what they taught, but man, I'll, I remember how they loved me and my friends. I can think of dozens of coworkers right now who love me and others well on our staff and almost nothing about what their actual job is. What if this week you weren't just a systems analyst, a store clerk, or a financial advisor? What if instead you were a person who loved people to the best of your ability and who also happened to have a job? See, here's what I find to be true. The path to meaningful work, it's not found in what we achieve. And Solomon is trying to just hammer down this point, but it's found in how we love people. 
fourth way to meaningful work is to realize that next isn't always better. As Solomon continues in verse 13, he, he continues by telling this story about a king who had succeeded at the highest levels. And he was nearing the end of his career, but, but he was no longer taking advice. And so people, the people who followed him, were kind of over him. But then these people got all excited about the next king, the king's successor, this young king who had risen from the bottom, and they were so ready for what's next. But then soon after, they were over that king as well. Verse 16, Solomon says, there was no end to all the people who were before them, but those who came later were not pleased with the successor. And then he's saying, this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind, the king and the up and comer advanced and achieved. They made it to the top. And they were initially loved and celebrated and people were excited for them. But soon after, they were long forgotten and people were ready for what's next again. See, Solomon is making the point not to put our hope and advancement and achievement and what's next. But we tend to do this, right? I mean, we're right smack dab in the middle of a political season, and so we put our hope in the next political party candidate, the next twins leadership change, the next boss that we're going to get. But Solomon is offering a word of caution. Don't put too much stock in what's next because those are going to disappoint us as well. Not only do we long for this what's next with others, but we tend to do this about ourselves when it comes to leadership. I mean, be honest, how many of you have thought or uttered these words, if I were in charge, once I'm the boss, oh, if I was the leader, things would be so much better. We dream of being the leader so that we can improve our work situation, but when we actually get there, we soon realize that being the leader is not that easy. As one author said, today's promotion just leads to tomorrow's pressure, so don't get too excited about what's next. Uh, we've all succumbed to the grass is greener syndrome at some point when it comes to work. I mean, all of us can resonate with these. You know, once we get that promotion, once we get to that office, once we finish this degree, well, once we get to that company, once we get to that salary range, once we retire to Florida and drink fresh squeezed orange juice in between games of pickleball, I mean, that's going to be the life. And I'm sure Solomon would agree there are, there are probably times where we do need a change and something next. But overall, one of the primary messages of Ecclesiastes is that the key to a meaningful life is to be present and embrace wherever God has put you. Life is going to end either way, so don't miss the current moment of work you're in. Now, people might be wondering, it's a fair question, what if I'm truly desiring something next in work for legitimate reasons? And Solomon would say, go for it. The point is not to lose our desire for something more. The point is to learn to embrace what's happening right now, no matter what the future holds. Even if we desire something different or better, we can't spend our days at work always hoping for what's next. Instead, the key to meaningful work is to enjoy your work now. Do a good work now. Be a loving employee right now. Why? Because life is short. And what's next isn't guaranteed to be better than now. Fifth and final way to a life of meaningful work and the most important is to work for the Lord. One of the best verses on work is found in Colossians chapter 3, written by Paul, who writes, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Whatever you do, janitor, Doctor, stay-at-home parent, teacher, secretary, accountant, CEO, landscape, whatever you do, the profession or title does not matter. Work for the Lord. That's why we give our best as Christ followers. That's why we work with integrity. 
That's why we seek the good of others and serve those we work with. That's why we try to align our ambition and purposes with God. That's why we love people. That's why we work hard. Not for money or status, trophies or achievement. We do those things because we are working for the Lord. When we work, we are either building things that will last or not. I mean, again, the life of Solomon, he built anything that he desired. He built homes. He built families. I mean, he built, he pursued all kinds of pleasure, anything that he desired, but all of those accumulations, all of those achievements that he tried to build, they didn't last. Instead, what lasted was the wisdom that God gave Solomon to share with us. By nature, work is about building and working towards something. And so the question we all have to ask ourselves when it comes to work, will what we build stand the test of time or not? In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about how God through fire will test the quality of our work and what we've built in life. And it's a sobering warning. But he says this, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. In other words, some of us are doing work that, that will not last. And others of us, our work is going to last. But let me be really clear. Before a bunch of you go out and quit your jobs to come work for the church, although we could use you, okay, eaglebrookchurch.com slash careers. We got a lot of openings, all right? But, <laughs> but let me be really uh, clear about this. The, the job and the profession, it doesn't matter. Whether you are a pastor, a construction worker, or a nurse, what matters most is whether you are working for the Lord or not. Recently, I've gotten to know a guy named Dan. Dan's the president of a bank, and as I've gotten to know him, what has impressed me the most is not how this bank has grown dramatically in 20 years, although that's, that's impressive. What's impressed me is not how this bank now has $2 billion on the balance sheet, although that's a shocking amount of money. What has impressed me is not how this bank has 200 employees and new locations across the country, although, you know, good for them. Instead, what has impressed me the most is Dan's strong desire to work for the Lord. The bank, it's not a Christian bank, but it's a bank that is led by a Christian. And Dan is doing everything he can to work for the Lord and build something that lasts. Just last month, I got to spend a few extra days with him and his team because he invited me to speak in an event that they were hosting. I watched as Dan treated every person, regardless of their net worth, with love and care. He frequently asks people, including me, how can I serve you right now? He labors over how to incorporate his faith in appropriate but bold ways in his workplace. And how does he do that? By loving his people, investing in their lives, and sharing how Jesus has changed his life every opportunity he gets. Now, I get it. You may not be CEO of a bank, but you are CEO of the life that God has given you. And whatever God has entrusted you with, he has put you in charge to work for him. And he's looking at you and saying, listen, work willingly at whatever you do, no matter the profession, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Where's your motivation? Who are you doing this for? Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master, your boss, the master you are serving is Jesus Christ. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Think of the impact that we can make and have in all of our workplaces if we all chose to work for the Lord. That's the better way to work. Let's pray across all of our locations and online. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you have entrusted us with work. It's hard to see it as a blessing. Man, I know so many people resonate with this idea that work is a curse and there's struggle and it's hard to scratch a living from it. So many people resonate with that. 
but we go back to your original intention with work, the intention for work to be seen as a gift, to be grateful, to seek out the most of every opportunity that we're given, whether we're someone who leads people or leads a company or works for someone or is still struggling to find a job or choosing to stay at home as a parent, whatever it is you have given us, even for those of us who've retired and don't necessarily receive an income from somewhere, God, every single person has been entrusted with work to cultivate, to labor over something, to love people no matter what environment we're in. As we all try to seek out better ways to work, God, just be with us, bless us, um, be good to us in these moments and remind us ultimately that we are working for you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, thanks for coming, everyone. If you want prayer, otherwise we'll see you next week.